to day two of source code auditing. Uh, back onto data types. So we started covering these. These are integer overflows, uh, things like that. There's a few more things I wanted to cover, mostly because of the technical difficulties from last class. I will try and cover it slower and be more consistent and thorough in the description. I realize that this stuff gets pretty complex. Okay, so just to cover signedness again, we remember sign, sign values, right? We, um, you can have, you can have uh, by default, everything is signed. So if we just declare a, a character Y, it's going to be signed by default, at least on x86. Um, it's, it's, this, is, uh, this is a caveat of a language that, that affects a lot of things. A lot of times when people are writing code, they don't realize that the value that they're, the integer or the char, the, whatever the data type is, can, can be negative. And we're going to see how that can have uh, negative effects, terrible pun intended. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so uh, the key thing here is that we, we can see we've got an unsigned char x and a char y, but these both have the same value as I'm about to show you, even though one is negative and one's just a larger value. The reason why this is, this is important is because uh, while you may be using a signed value to do your calculations, a lot of functions, a lot of library functions in libc, for example, which take size arguments, only take unsigned variables. And so you may do your calculations or something and result in a negative number, and it will have <coughs> unintended effects when you pass that or use that in logic for finding out the size that gets passed to a, to a, to a library function. And so let's, let's look at what, what type of vulnerabilities can happen there. So I showed you that char x and unsigned char, or rather char y and unsigned char x are the same. So in the case where I said that x was 255 on the last slide, y is negative 1. That's because the, all the bits are set in each one. And because this is negative, it's 2's complement, which means it works sort of backwards, leading back to negative 1. Again, this math is, can get sort of tricky, but isn't as important. It's not as important to know the math as it is to know that the phenomena exists. So let's look at a code sample here. Um, if we go, if we take a look at this, this is something similar to ones we see before where a size is, come, is read off the network by a piece of code. So we have this, like, we read from sock into length for the size of length, right? Length is an integer, though. And by, as it is an integer, it is by default signed. And again, because every data type is signed until you explicitly declare otherwise, this macro for max sock buff is also a signed value. That's important because when we compare these two, they're going to be compared as signed values, which means that if somebody provides us with a length which reads negative, let's say the length was negative 1, when we do this length check, it's going to evaluate as true. So let's take a look at this. So it's a check between two signed values, right? So if length is negative, highest bit is set, it will evaluate as less than max sock buff because in this, bump, in, this, in this comparison, length is being seen as negative one, this is 4096. Mm -hmm. But remember, because the highest bit is set, um, and when we pass this to a function that takes unsigned values, it's gonna implicitly uh, convert it to an unsigned value. So, take a look at this example. Uh, reading, reading on, we have length, max sock buff, this passes the check, however, when we pass length to read, as we do in our code sample, this converts it to the unsigned equivalent for an integer. For 32 bits, all bits set, the value is 4 gigs. I'm pretty sure that when this, when this was written, the, the developer did not intend to read in 4 gigs of data into their buffer that's no bigger than 4K. But this is a signedness issue. This is because they declared it as a signed value, and that's what the language does by default. And so by doing so, they've, they've opened up the, the, the application to uh, memory corruption hilarity. So, the other thing I wanted to touch on with data types was uh, the, the variation in data types. We've seen that we have integers, and I, I show a lot of examples with chars or cars because they're 8 bits and they're easy to represent on the screen. Um, I'll be probably doing that a lot where I can, only because representing full 32 bits across the screen is, is painful and doesn't, it doesn't make a good visual. Uh, but just, again, a little refresher. Your integers are 32 bits, again, assuming x86. Shorts are 16 and cars are 8. The thing is that to save space, maybe in like structure definitions or just to save stack space, a lot of times code will be written to use, and a lot of legacy code from older systems, to use smaller data types where possible. Um, so let's, let's think of an example here. Take a look at this assignment. We have an integer, we'll call it big value. We have a short, we'll call it small value. They're both unsigned, so now we're avoiding that whole negative positive comparison issue. But we're doing an assignment. We're saying small value equals big value. Can anybody tell me what's going to happen here? Correct. So here, the 16 bits is being assigned the value from 32 bits. But it can only contain 16 bits of value. So what happens? Well, we have the high, I, I, I've, I've marked these up in 8-bit chunks for each, for each integer or short that we're looking at. So this represents all of, all of big value, right? 
As you can see here in hex, it's 4433 If you wanted to break this down byte by byte, you could see it at 8 bits, 8 bits, 8 bits, 8 bits. This is the 16 bits though, right? That we are, we are, we are trying to assign to a 16 bit variable. So all that it receives are the lower 16 bits of that, of that integer when you make this assignment. Now, if you see this happen, lots of vulnerabilities can come about. Consider this. Size too big function takes an unsigned int user size. We're making sure we're using unsigned. We don't want to have any negative weirdness comparison issues. We have an unsigned short length. I don't know why this was written this way, but let's just say it was. We have you know, length equal user size, and we check, ah, crap, this is incorrect, actually. It should be if length is greater than or equal to this. This would be correct. Ah, I apologize. This should be length. But the point is that um, if for some reason the value is passed in as this, this becomes the value that we check because this is the last lower 16 bits of the truncation, right? We pass this in, we do this check, it's no longer valid. Or it's, it, the check doesn't, doesn't tell us what the size, that the size is not too big, right? The check is gained by the fact that there are higher bits we're missing. That's commonly called uh, data type truncation. You can see this in lots of, lots of, um, you know, lots of, co I, I've actually found a bug like this in the kernel. Uh, that it's the only, one of the only bugs I've ever reported in the Linux kernel of something similar like this where they, they were using a car to represent the size and, uh, and you had data type, you had truncation. So it's a, uh, it's, it does actually happen in real code, so look for it. Um, so what are the auditing notes we want to take away from these two examples? Always look at the, any type you see a size used for any sort of memory calculation, look at it. Is it signed? Was it declared, was it not declared unsigned, rather? If it was not declared unsigned, it is probably signed by default, unless you're using some crazy special, special type. And maybe they didn't mean it to ever be negative, and can you influence it to be negative, and what are the effects on the logic of the application if you can? Uh, the other thing is looking for, looking for when smaller data types are used, right? So if we see a short being used, maybe in some sort of protocol representation. They only want to use 16 bits. How, how is that used and how does it interact with other variables? Do we ever see an integer become the, used to assign the value of a short or a car or anything like that? When you see those, you can get these weird cases which lead to memory corruption. It sounds silly and it sounds really simple, but it's, it's a very effective way to find bugs uh, if, you, if you see this happening in code. So we've covered, we've covered data types. Um, and something that I wanted to cover more of last class that, uh, that we started to get into on the board a little bit was meta character injection. Uh, this is far less complicated than, than the, uh, some of the stuff that we were covering before with integers, and that's why I want to make sure we, we had a solid understanding of those, and that's why we, we touched back on those before getting into, the, um, before getting into this. And uh, this meta character injection, it's going to cover a lot of bug classes. I sort of, I sort of summarize a lot of bug classes under this, but we will, uh, we'll show a few examples of them, and we'll have you guys try and maybe think of others as we go through. But Wikipedia defines meta character, uh, a meta character itself as a character that has special meaning instead of a literal meaning to a computer program, like a shell interpreter or a regular expression engine. Uh, these, are, these, are, these are characters that you use to sort of uh, either delimit or specify special behavior to these type of things, right? So let's, let's look at some examples here. We've got a Linux, Unix, whatever it's shell you want to call it. And we can see that there's a command being executed, or actually a series of commands here. So first we have, you know, the shell, where, where, little, little character in the game, right, a shell. We're echoing a command, doing something, and echoing another command. What's going on here? It has very specific syntax. So we look at it. We have the basic command, right? This is what's being passed to the shell. But then we have these meta characters. These are specifying that this delimits what's happening to the command. And we have this other, we have this other character in here. Perfect example of another meta character, a semicolon. This is going to split the command in two. This tells the shell end processing of this command, but potentially process another command. So afterwards, we can see another command inserted with another expression. And as a result, both of these commands are executed by just entering this one line, right? These are two separate unique commands separated and delimited by meta characters. So what are, the type of, uh, what are the type of things that can happen here? A lot of times, applications will need to do stuff with the shell. Um, there's, there's various reasons this can happen. Uh, I find a lot of it's generally laziness. Maybe a developer wants to unzip a file, but they don't want to go learn the gzip library or, or other, you know, zlib or any of that type of stuff. Maybe they just don't understand or have access to another component. You'll notice that there are teams of, of, of you know, products will be split up into teams of different components. And maybe it just needs to access something used by another team, but it's not a library, so it just has to run a command. But a lot of times it's just laziness. And you'll see this in shell scripts. You'll see all sorts of crazy stuff happen. Um, so let's, let's look, take a look at a basic example. Can anybody tell me what can happen here? 
we have a function here. Yes. You, if, if you give this your file some uh, some maliciously crafted uh, command to the shell, it'll get executed. Specifically, if you give it, give me an example of one of these meta characters. We just covered. Give it a semicolon. Perfect. So we can see here that this extract user zip function takes a user file, presumably a string to a file on this. And we populate this buffer, and there's no buffer overflow here. It's, it's 1024, we, we, I mean, we specify our size adequately. We say unzip as the command, name the user file, and then we pass it directly to system. System uh, on Unix, Linux, whatever, uh, executes, passes it to a shell. The shell executes the command, and you can, you can also get sort of uh, exit status results and stuff, but that's not, that's not relevant here. So, for example, uh, here's, here's what, a, what it should look like, right? If it's blah.zip, it gets the shell command, you know, unzip, blah.zip would function normally. But if we were to, for some reason, say w get from evil site good stuff dot shell script and then execute it, all the, uh, sort of ending and recreating new, new commands within this one string using the semicolons, um, when this is executed, obviously it fetches it down, runs it, insert arbitrary payload here. This class sounds trivial and stupid, and it seems obvious that this should not be programmed in. But I, I kid you not, there is software. There is security software in particular in the last year. This is still zero day. Somebody found and showed me, which off of, off of the network would execute a, a, a command based on data it would receive. So the specs were but this is development. Right. Right. That happens. Or they had timeline issues, right? <laughs> I mean, these things happen, happen a lot. Or they just didn't even consider it. Um, there's actually another another case that's sort of interesting. I found was there uh, there was an embedded Linux uh, BIOS type of thing that I that I saw on a friend's motherboard recently, where he uh, he had it. And he noticed that it was doing all sorts of it could do all sorts of really basic OS functions uh, just within the BIOS, like like check network connectivity and things like that. We found that you could append stuff to ping and and sort of execute things outside of uh, you know outside of the command. So it's just passing it into a command shell. What was interesting about that though is that you had all sorts of crazy privilege levels, levels here by doing so that they did not intend. It didn't require any of the admin password or anything to get into this part. So it was a sort of like a low level BIOS vulnerability all because of command injection. So these bugs sound silly, but they do exist and uh, you should keep your eye open for them. So, um, yeah. What would you do if you, if you if could go back to the uh, You bet. What if you had, what if that, uh, what would you do if that safe Give you a really, really small, small amount of data to work with. Yeah. Yeah. So you you can you can definitely be limited by that. I mean, 1024 isn't a particularly large amount of data to work with either. But if you if you did if let's say you could execute it over and over again, let's say it was you know I don't know maybe 256, 256 because that's the max path and they're not even going to consider that this could 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 take up some of that space. You could possibly echo and then redirect into a file. So instead of uh, you, you'd echo, and you, you know about a redirect meta characters. So the, the meta character, it's a it's it's a chevron. It's a, a less than sign, or greater than sign rather. If you use those inside of a shell, it tells to redirect the output from that to a file. So you could echo over and over, redirecting output. You could e trigger trigger it over and over again to write a shell script, and then maybe use one to execute the shell script. There are a hundred more ways to exploit this. Um, there are. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Sorry. Um, there, there are lots of ways to exploit this, and uh, I mean, there's also lots of ways to do this correctly, but, but I very rarely see it done. So if you guys see this in code, you know, play with it, try and find a way to, to exploit it. Okay, so this subclass of meta character injection is, is most commonly just called uh, command injection, but it's not just on Linux or Unix, and there's a massive list of meta characters. Actually, in the book, The Art of Software Security Assessment, there's this awesome table they show you of shell meta characters and the different ways you can use them and leverage them. Uh, and they, they have different uses in different cases. And it's important to take a look at these. I recommend reading through that list. And whenever, because whenever you find this bug, you'll often find that developers were kind of aware of it, and they tried to sort of manually go through and extract these characters themselves. So for example, a developer might say, aha, if we see a semicolon, we know that they're, they're attempting command injection. So abort or remove the semicolon from the, from the input stream. But that doesn't change it, right? You have other characters. You have like the ampersand, which means run in the background, or double ampersand, which means run in conjunction. So you could have, you, you know, uh, it's, it's actually an and case in the shell where it says if this, then and this. So it's like a, it's like a literally like a, a bitwise and. Um, these, these can also be used, but there's, there's numerous other ones. Again, redirecting output. Maybe the output of what's being ran, you would find beneficial. So 
if you uploaded the zip and you knew the type of data that was going to be maybe some other other output coming out of the zip, you, the file names, you could, you could have contain something malicious and redirect it to another file that would then be read elsewhere. The fact that you can influence the command is the vulnerability. The execution of commands may not be the exploit, but the fact you can influence commands is the vulnerability. So don't give up just because they may strip out certain meta characters. Um, also, if you recall, during our profiling stage, our attack surface identification stage, we wanted to trace input, right, and see where it goes in the application. It's going to be important to find command injection uh, because you'll find that a lot of times programs will have sort of like that system command written in where it, it'll do something, but maybe it'll do it with values that you don't control. So just because you see this, it, it's, it's good to get excited, but it may not be a value. So this is why tracking where your input can hit in the application is very important up front when you're profiling, right? Because you'll be able to quickly identify that this is reachable by, by you and that you can influence the input. Okay, so um, how do you find this in code? Easiest way, uh, if you haven't traced your input and you don't immediately see code paths, is to grep around for system or you know, shell exec or any, any of these functions that sort of they call out uh, the, to the shell. Uh, there's there's long list of APIs that do this. There's all I mean all sorts of them that can be influenced. Exec v, exec cl. There's a whole I mean whole families of functions, right? Um, looking around for them is good. Also, looking around for them will show you the behavior. So maybe there's there are cases where you don't get to reach it, right? You see system called, but input goes into it, you don't reach it. If you do see strings being built and being passed to system, that's a very bad behavior, and it, it, it's probably like that you will find a case somewhere, so keep looking. It also is, is indicative of bad behavior in general with building strings and using them, and as we're gonna see, uh, anywhere you see a type of bad behavior, you're probably gonna find a vulnerability, even if it's not in system, if it's manipulating files in the file system or building database query strings, as, as we're about to get into. Does anybody have any questions on this? Anything else? Maybe it would be good if uh, during the during the post exploitation we show some of this stuff and some of our bugs to land. Yeah. yeah. I, I have a question from what you did for the last class. Absolutely. You were, you were talking about how uh, in particular uh, how much of a red flag it raises when when, uh, when programmers uh, do manual uh, point arithmetic. Yes. Right. So what would you um, what are some maybe some some general like heuristics uh, for you to follow if, if you if you see uh, if you see some point arithmetic what would you uh, so in various things, in file formats or, or protocols, a lot of times the specification for the file format will have something like uh, there will be an integer delineating length or an integer of, of a certain field, right? And if they're using pointer arithmetic to parse this input, maybe they'll strip an integer out of that and then use that to advance the pointer. So like take this integer out of the stream, advance the pointer by this much. That's immediately a vulnerability no matter how they do it because you can either advance the pointer out to a, to a piece of memory where it's reading from um, or potentially even writing to, uh, or you may be able to even wrap it back around. I mean, there's various ways you can manipulate that. At the very least, it's going to provide a memory disclosure vulnerability, which, as you start to bypass, like, sort of protection mechanisms will be useful. And, and, and worse than that, you, can, you may be able to get the application completely out of state. Um, ideally, you want to offset or upset pointers that you're writing to, uh, but any pointer arithmetic. I mean, if it's in a, another one, it's just anything that's in a loop where it's writing data. Can you see it? if you can cause it to maybe iterate the loop or not break the loop when it should based on length restrictions? Um, you know, it's, it's really, it's really case specific. Just general complexity. If you see maybe nested loops and lots of switch statements causing pointer arithmetic, I'd read that closely. And that's where, you know, like graph paper and a pen comes in very handy. So you can write out every case and sort of enumerate the state. Uh, but there's, I guess there's no real, no real immediate answer to that. All right. So SQL injection. I touched on this lightly, uh, last class, but I actually wanted to cover it formally. Um, a little bit. It's going to become more relevant during the web hacking part of the class because the instructor that will come in and teach that part is going to show you what SQL, SQL injection looks like when you're actually facing a website and how to exploit it. And so to complement that, I thought that I should cover how you would find it in code, what it looks like in code, and really what it sort of means. I believe when I asked last time, a fair number of people have been exposed, but a few had not been to SQL in, uh, in general. So we're just going to do a really light refresher on it and, uh, and cover you know just the basics. So. What is SQL? It's a structured, or structured query language. Uh, programming language is, is sort of how, how Wikipedia defined it. I don't really consider it that. I consider it, I mean, I guess you could call it that. I think of it more sort of scripting to access a database, but I guess, you know, whatever. Uh, it's for relational databases. It's for asking for a piece of data as it relates to another piece of data uh, in the most general terms, right? The cool thing about SQL and the bugs that we can find with SQL are that it, it's not language specific. So. A lot of this memory corruption that we've been talking about affects C and C++ or other, you know, other compiled languages and, uh, 
And then it's, it, you'll never you'll never see that in, in code written in Java, right? You won't see memory corruption unless it's, it's using unsafe things from un underneath the language, which will be very uncommon. And you won't see it in .NET for the same reason. Mind you, those interpreters can have memory corruption, but that's a different story. Um, SQL, though, is used all over. It's used by C, C++, it's used by web applications, it's used everywhere. It's a very, very popular database uh, language. And so when you find vulnerabilities in it, they're sort of, sort of universal and they're very reliable. So how does SQL work? Um, you basically have these, this, this concept of, of tables, right? You have this table like country, and it's represented in columns and rows. So you have like uh, one column being name, one column being population, one column being square miles, and then maybe notes. This would be a very stupid example here of like, you could, you could look up data from a country called Canada and get its population, right? So like, let's, let's look at, for example, um, what, what a query might look like. So we build out these queries where we'd say, select everything from country where name equals USA. So if we look back at this, that's gonna give us the population, the square mileage, and the notes that we have for that field. Now, can anybody maybe immediately off the bat see where meta character Meta characters are used here, and if so, what, what could what could sort of be a problem that could, that could happen? Dan didn't bring any candy for me to throw at you, but I'd be happy to throw this cob pipe at anyone if they uh. <laughs> Obviously, the asterisk. Well, the asterisk is, is sort of a, is is like a, a it's a static it's a static value in there, but we do have we do have something here where we're we're sort of using an extra tick mark to delineate something. This this is maybe this is like a dynamic search term we're using, right? So. Let's take a look at like this query as, as we can break it down. Uh, I shamelessly stole this from Wikipedia, and it's but I thought it and that's it's actually why I built the table that we saw on the last screen. I thought it depicts sort of the statements uh, very cleanly. So an example here, this would be like an update, an update clause, right? What this would do would be update a table, uh, a row inside of the table. So we're updating a country, something in the country, to set population equals to current population plus one, where name equals USA. So this would very simply, in our previous example, add one to this value. But this language is, is fairly, fairly straightforward and, and, and structured, and it's, it's meant to be intuitive, right? It reads as, just exactly as it does. You have like select, you know, select, get me something from users where name equals username, right? Here's like an example you might see in something that does authentication or fetches information about a user possibly for authorization or, or other metadata. Um, but as we can see, a string is being built here, right? This is sort of a generic web application pseudocode, but not uncommon to have you know, something like this, plus you know, the tick mark here, end of quotes, plus username, tick mark. So meta characters that we can sort of infer here, characters being used by the structured language to delineate data, are these, these, these little tick marks, right? So what happens if we, can, if we can mess with those? Consider, for example, if we were to insert uh, a meta character followed by SQL logic. So in this case, if we were to add tick mark or tick mark one, tick mark equals tick mark one, when that gets inserted, we get that same statement becomes select everything from users where name equals blank or where one equals one. Being that the truth always, it's always evaluates as true because one will always equal one. Uh, this, this statement will always, always execute and this can be used to, to do all sorts of things, right? Um, so there's, there's lots that can be done from the exploitation of SQL. <coughs> I'm not going to go into the detail in the exploitation because that's uh, it's something that I think Joe Hemler teaches, and he he does a great job. It's his focus. He does very. I'd never even come close. But just to give you an idea of some of the things you can do if you can influence SQL, uh, you can you can dump contents from the database. So if the database contains credit card numbers, passwords, whatever, um, you can insert new data. You can modify existing data. Maybe change your privileges if those are stored in the database. Right? Those are flags. And there are ways to cause SQL to output to disk and cause all sorts of other issues, ultimately compromising the machine. Um, and in particular, something I didn't put up here is that uh, some older versions of MS SQL, and actually I think it can be re-enabled on newer versions, can execute commands on the system. And so just by doing little logic tricks influencing the SQL query, you can end up taking over the whole machine. So it's important to sort of think about these things. And uh, yeah, does anybody have any questions? I hear crickets, and I think I saw a tumbleweed. All right. All right, so some auditing tips. If we properly profile the application like we wanted to, right? Uh, we saw where the input is, we saw where the output is, and we, we looked at the resources. We consider the database a resource. So it's something used by the application. It's a target of an attacker. It could be the end goal of the attacker. It could be something used by an attacker to, to leverage their access. 
So we'd know by our profile and whether or not they use SQL, because that should have been part of our you know, sort of initial evaluation. Um, looking around for SQL queries themselves, so if we just grep around for the word select in, in capitals, or maybe select star, if you look for the word S, you know, SQL statement or some of the keywords that are used to pass SQL queries onto the database, you can find it. It's usually pretty easy to find. And then just seeing if, if a query is constructed without any sort of parameterization or, or encoding done on your input. You see that's almost definitely SQL injection. Now, if they do parameterization, that doesn't mean that it's not SQL injection. There are a lot of times where people will do their homegrown parameterization, and that doesn't really remove uh, the, the vulnerability, just sort of like resorts the data. I, I've seen that a lot in applications. A lot of people seem to misunderstand uh, the, the vulnerability, I guess. Have you ever seen people stripping out meta characters? Yes. It's very similar, right. So very similar to the shell, you'll see people, uh, like one, one that is common is you'll see people add a, uh, add a backslash to the tick mark, thinking that that, add, that that does something. So then uh, logically what you do is just insert a backslash tick mark, and when they add a backslash, it just backslashes out your backslash, your tick mark exists, right? So it, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a great, it's a great way to, so, so you know, be cognizant. There, there are some, and there are some, good, uh, there are some good APIs for doing this. I believe MySQL in particular in PHP has, has one that's very solid, very difficult to beat, but they have been beaten actually. Uh, even some of the ones put out by vendors that are very solid have been beaten through, through Unicode interpretation and all sorts of decoding. Um, and I, I would not be surprised if there's not more space for research there, although it's, it's probably pretty exhausted. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Excellent. All right, so on to another meta character injection bug. File input and output is something that I, I wanted to stress when we were looking at profiling application. Um, because meta characters happen a lot on the file system or in, in sort of file system like, like a dot, right? That, that adds, a, adds a, an extension to a file. The dot's sort of like a meta character, right? Um, there's, but there's other things that we can, we can see here. There's other, other ways, other things that the file system does. So there's a vulnerability here. Um, there's actually a couple, but, but we're, we're going to, can anybody maybe immediately spot something that could happen with taking file from a, from a get request? Oh, do, uh, let me back up. How many of you have written PHP? Okay. And uh, how many of you have said general exposure to PHP? Anyone? No, all right. So PHP is a common and um, used to be a popular, a popular language. Luckily, it's getting replaced by, by some others. Uh, as we have like Ruby with Rails and uh, you know, various Microsoft technologies and things. And the reason I say that is uh, PHP is notoriously uh, open and lends itself to being written terribly. And I mean that in that it's written well from a readability standpoint often, but it, it, it gives so much availability for the developer to, to introduce vulnerabilities into the code. Um, so in just these two lines, well, in just this one line, there are multiple vulnerabilities present, and it's, it's, it's that there's it's completely representative of the type of things that can happen, right? So this is actually still a somewhat common example. I, I found this on an audit recently. Um, not too recently, but within the last six months. Uh, and so, and Let's, let's take a look here. So I'm sure maybe some of you are familiar with the concept of directory traversal bugs. Uh, so the first, the first issue we have here is that there's nothing, nothing stopping somebody from inserting in this get parameter and uh, in, in the data that's sent to the web application dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash. So when this is open, it's now ideally, like for example, we could put this in here, right? But this doesn't quite give you maybe what the attacker would be looking for because as we saw, a .txt is always appended, right? To, to the end of the string. So maybe this could be useful, not for Etsy password because if that file traditionally Unix does not have .txt present, but maybe there's other text files on the file system you're interested in or other things like that. But there's still more going on here, right? There's still more meta characters at play. So let's talk about some of that. Different languages like PHP or Java or all, all sorts of things We'll treat different meta character have, have different sort of you know meta characters that affect what they can and can't do or, or how they how they work. SQL has those tick marks, right? Has other things you can insert, and we saw that that you know the shell commands, things that pass to the shell, the ampersand, the semicolon. Um, a lot of a lot of times though, you'll notice that as technologies are sort of stacked on top of each other, you you introduce differences in how meta characters are handled. So maybe one doesn't care about the ampersand or the semicolon, but the the technology that it talks to or uses does. So let's, let's, uh, let's, let's think about like PHP, for example, right? PHP relies on, uh, relies on C libraries to do a lot of the file system type stuff, right? And C, if we recall, when it handles strings uh, from the previous section, our strings are terminated in null bytes, 
Does everybody recall this, right? So like the present location of the null byte determines the length of the string. But PHP doesn't care about null bytes. PHP uh, takes a string of data as you pass it and has its own way of representing what is and isn't a string. And so because of that, uh, you have sort of, sort of interesting behaviors can arise when you, when you sort of have interaction between the two. So let's go back to our example here. Because PHP is indifferent to null, and because we can insert our, our dot dot slash, uh, this can create all sorts of interesting problems. For example, let's say that instead the user inserted the string dot dot slash dot dot slash at C password null byte. Now while PHP is like, oh yeah, we know what that is, that's, uh, that's, this, that's this file right here, the underlying library, because it was written in C and compiled, is observant of the null byte and stops accessing the string at that point, and thus it gets this file to open. This is actually what we wanted, right? So this is a combination of bugs. It's a conjunction of two bugs. It's directory traversal mixed with null byte insertion. And it's been notorious. I believe it was first, uh, first reported on by, by RFP back in like the early 2000s, if not the late 90s. But you still see this in code. Uh, and it's just a, it's a great classic example of, of meta character injection sort of in, into a stream. So what are the takeaways here? What do, what do we want to think about? Well, so PHP null byte insertion and directory traversal are still, still common. They're around, but mostly in like private apps. Maybe if you get hired on an engagement to pen test something and you are able to steal source code off of a box or something, you'll find this type of bug. But it's not too common anymore in, uh, in open source stuff. I mean, it still happens. I think, I think PHP bulletin board had it last in 2006 or 2007. So it's not too far out there. <coughs> but the concept remains the same, right? You see your data. It's going into a string of data. And it's going to be handled by some sort of interpreter. It's going to be handled by some sort of uh, parsing mechanism. What are, what are the special characters that parking, parsing mechanism uh, thinks about? What does it care about? Uh, can you, and can you cause it, you know, file system access is always, almost always broken. I, I have not seen uh, in any audit that I've done a file upload functionality, for example, that was done right. Uh, and, and sometimes that's due to maybe flaws in some of the underlying APIs or inconsistencies, but that doesn't make it any less vulnerable. So you, you want to play with these things, and you want to look at them. And, just, and, and there's also lots of documentation on meta characters, so, so look into them. Um, writing to files would be ideal, right? If that, in that last example, we showed where it opens a file. If we could write to that file, that'd be great. Why? Because it's a web application. It, it runs PHP. If we could write our own PHP file to disk, we could execute arbitrary PHP code, and it's game over. But it's just a very, very sort of uh, typical example there. 